Anyway, I'm going to uh, follow up on uh, Armand's talk, and the title of my talk is uh, "Is Your Brain a Quantum Orchestra Tuned to the Universe?" And uh, you see this. You may have seen this slide before from me, uh, showing this uh, spectrum. Starting, uh, it's a scale invariant hierarchy, and uh, there have been models of hierarchical brain organization around for a while, usually starting with neurons going larger and slower in the EEG. So you start with fast EEG and, and going upwards, you get uh, slower and they're so similar fractal uh, Rakeley and Marcus Rakeley and, uh, and Baju, he had, had a very good one uh, a number of years ago. Um, but uh, th the point they were missing is that the hierarchy extends inward inside neurons uh, faster and faster, smaller, faster, and eventually into the quantum realm. And the DDG that Anurban discovered um, uh, it fits this perfectly. And what you see here is kind of an interpretation of that, starting on the far left with a pyramidal neuron. Uh, uh, and I think the layer five uh, cortical pyramidal neurons are probably the best bet for consciousness. It could happen other places too, but the, the layer of, uh, of uh, pyramidal neurons uh, blanketing the cortex with the basilar dendrites connecting forming uh, what Carl Prebram called uh, uh, a web, dendritic web, can uh, give rise to interference to hologram and so forth. But the, the, the pyramidal neurons are, are, are the key, I think. And then moving, uh, and they're at about 10 to the zero. They're in the, the Hertz, uh, Hertz range. That's EEG basically on the far left. And then as we move to the right, uh, and you can see at the bottom, the triplets of triplets, um, uh, we, we get uh, to uh, kilohertz, 10 to the uh, third Hertz, with networks of microtubules, and then uh, uh, 10 to the six, a million hertz, megahertz with microtubules, and then uh, move, uh, rows of tubulin dipoles within the microtubule, uh, gigahertz, 10 to the ninth, a billion hertz, and then tubulin, uh, terahertz, and then these, uh, these dipoles uh, in, uh, I guess that would be petahertz, and this is where anesthesia acts, uh, actually, at the level of these dipole oscillations. And then uh, even faster, we get to the, um, the atomic nuclei being in quantum states. And I don't know what 10 to the 18th Hertz is called. And then, um, and then continuing uh, smaller and smaller. And the last step is a big one. Uh, if uh, we, we get to Roger Penrose's uh, space-time geometry, we go all the way, presumably, this, this is... Uh, uh, Hypothetical. I think uh, the, the part that Anurban covered is, is no longer hypothetical, although the exact alignment with the structures is, is, a, is a guess, but uh, close enough. And eventually all the way to the Planck scale. So uh, this could be a, a scale invariant hierarchy going all the way down uh, to the basement level of the universe. And whether there's, uh, you know, emergent space time beneath that or whatever, um, I, I think if we get to the, uh, the Planck scale, that's, that's good enough for now. So this uh, scale invariant hierarchy um, uh, matches uh, Honor Bond's discovery, which I think will, will turn out to be one of the great discoveries uh, in, in modern science. Uh, in a few years, we're going to look back at this. So uh, with that, I'll go to the next slide. And um, most view, view the brain as a complex computer of simple neurons. You know, all the, the theories we've had uh, for a few years, IIT and, and uh, global neuronal workspace and uh, the others are all uh, complex arrangements of very simple neurons. Uh, they could be bits, one or zero. But yet, if we look at a single cell like a paramecium, it would be one bit, but it's pretty clever. It can swim around, find food, find mates. It could even have sex, as we see here, and that could be conscious at that level. Um, but the point is, it, it's obviously not one bit. It may, may or may not be conscious. I think it is at a very slow frequency but it's certainly not a one or a zero. It's much more intelligent and cognitive than that. So something else must be going on. And that is, I believe, to be the microtubules inside the neurons. And here we see a schematic uh, of a synapse on the left, an axon, a dendr dendritic spine, and the microtubules inside both the axon and the dendrite. And within the dendrite, they're interrupted in a mixed polarity, which uh, helps uh, cause interference patterns, which uh, I won't go into it uh, at this point. And then you see how the microtubules on the right 
four, four steps in a uh, automata actually manifest patterns uh, due to interactions uh, between the tubulins. And this, this work goes back to the 80s. This is when I first got into uh, microtubules uh, before I got the quantum bug. But the point is there's information processing going on at a smaller scale. And that's when we get into the DDG. So, um, but that wouldn't explain consciousness. It would be more computation. But as somebody said to me once in, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, okay, uh, wise ass, so what? How would that explain consciousness? It's just more computation. And uh, I was kind of stunned because uh, the person was right. He was throwing the hard problem in my face before it had been invented or described by Chalmers. But of course, other people had said the same thing. But he, uh, and I can't remember who it is, I wish I could to thank him, suggested I read uh, Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, which said that consciousness is not computation, but requires a non-computable quantum mechanism tied to the fine scale structural geometry of the universe, which was a mind blowing, and still is a mind blowing concept. And another one, um, really great, fantastic uh, step forward in science, which is taking decades and decades to be appreciated as, as many great discoveries are. So uh, it forced me to look into quantum mechanics, which I didn't know much about. And uh, I'll give you my uh, uh, view in a nutshell, or in a, in a yin yang actually, where uh, the world is divided into uh, the quantum realm of small stuff, which can have quantum superposition of multiple possibilities. Things can be here and here at the same time, in two different states, non-local, uh, entangled over space and time, wave-like and small. And uh, that there's also the classical world that we're familiar with, where things are large, uh, predictable, uh, follow Newton's laws, um, and so forth. Classical, localized, particle-like, and large. And uh, that's what we're used to. And uh, consciousness, I believe, is on the edge between the, between the quantum and the classical. And uh, if this looks familiar, it's, the, uh, it's also the logo, logo for this year's Tucson conference. And I actually got this idea from uh, somebody who pointed me to the Kabbalah, which said that, uh, that there were these two realms and that consciousness danced on the edge between the two worlds. So that's stuck in my mind. And, um, and so I, I think that's actually right. Well, whether you look at it that uh, superpositions collapse, uh, causing consciousness, which Penrose and I believe, or whether consciousness causes collapse the other way. Either way, uh, consciousness is between the quantum and classical. So for example, uh, superposition, uh, this is the fundamental, one of the fundamental issues along with entanglement and trying to understand what the heck's going on here. And uh, this is a, in the foreground, a cesium atom in yellow and uh, as a particle. And in the background, you see it as a wave. It's the same thing in multiple locations at the same time. Yet when we observe it, we only see the particle. And that's called, this is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. When you make a measurement of the wave, it turns into a particle and it chooses one of those locations. But the, before you even get to that question, the measurement problem, how can a particle be in superposition of multiple locations simultaneously? That's a key question that everybody kind of bypasses. Everyone except of course, Roger who addressed this head on uh, in his book, The Emperor's New Mind. And he accounted for superposition through Einstein's general relativity, uh, merging uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity, which everybody says, well, they don't jive, they don't mix, they don't talk to each other, except they do if you consider this. Uh, uh, his view, I think, uh, again, uh, uh, solves this, this riddle. And um, Einstein said that uh, matter was equivalent to curvature in fundamental space-time geometry. You could argue that the curvature creates the mass or the mass creates the, cur the curvature, but in either case, they, they correlate. And this has been shown for large objects like the sun, for example, bending light from distant stars or around it. And Eddington, uh, Einstein predicted that, and Eddington did the experiment in 1919 and proved him to be correct. And Eddington won his own Nobel Prize. So that's for big things. Penrose applied it to small things. He said, well, what about tiny quantum particles? And he used these um, uh, two-dimensional space-time sheets in his book, The Emperor's New Mind, where he took three dimensions of space and put them into one dimension so he could write, it, write a drawing, make, 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 put it on a page. So you so he have these space-time sheets um, and a particle is a curvature, as you can see. And in the, uh, in the 
Can you see my cursor? So the particle's here, and then it moves over here. And uh, so you can, a particle oscillating would be actually be space-time curvatures oscillating back and forth, alternate space-time curvatures. So uh, you can look at everything as particles, or you can look at it as curvatures in space-time geometry. Therefore, a sep uh, superposition would be on the right would be the uh, two the same particle. It's not two particles. It's the same particle in two locations with two space-time curvatures. So space-time in this case is actually separating. It's bifurcating. And uh, so what what's going to happen next? Well, if you believe in many worlds, you'd say that it separates and each possibility branches off and forms its own universe. So universe one has the particle and, and universe two has the same particle in a different location, different state. And that's the many worlds uh, hypothesis, which seems ridiculous uh, to many people, including myself, but is at least, uh, uh, at least among one group of physicists is the most uh, popular idea, many worlds, because it avoids consciousness, it avoids collapse and, uh, and there you go. They can, they can uh, just shut up and calculate. Other people think that consciousness, uh, shown here as being in the conscious observer, causes collapse. So uh, this uh, person is observing this separation in space-time. And when that occurs, one of the curvatures ceases to exist and the particle no longer is there. And the other one continues. So uh, this is uh, this this kind of works also, but it puts consciousness outside science. It's dualist. Uh, it doesn't explain consciousness. It makes it even more mysterious. It doesn't explain how it causes superposition, nor what superposition actually is. Roger took a different view and uh, said that um, um, these separations would uh, would reach a threshold shown on the timeline uh, lower left at time t equals h bar over e sub g, where h bar is the Planck direct constant, and e sub g is the gravitational self energy, the amount of energy required to pull that particle apart from itself, uh, separated itself, or pull the space time uh, uh, apart, separated, the same thing. And this gives rise to a moment of conscious experience, bing. And uh, uh, this is, uh, the, uh, I think I, I lost a couple of slides here, but these, uh, these proto-conscious, uh, these moments at that level would be proto-conscious. They wouldn't be organized. They would be kind of random, disconnected, lack meaning, lack memory, but they would be here, there, and everywhere, and they could be any type of experience. Um, uh, but some of them would be pleasurable, and, uh, and we'll come back to that point. Um, but in any case, they'd be random and disconnected. So how could they be orchestrated in the brain for full, rich, conscious experience or orchestrated anywhere? And um, so Rod, Roger, uh, okay, uh, this one should have gone previously, along with a moment of conscious experience. So that was the point. These, these particles would be, sorry, these, these separations would be unstable and self-collapse, undergo objective reduction at time t equals h, h bar should be over e sub g, and you get bing, you get a moment of conscious experience. Um, and so rather than consciousness causing collapse in the Copenhagen interpretation, um, it's actually the other way around. Uh, collapse causes, collapse by OR causes or is equivalent to identity, th identity theory is consciousness. Uh, the, uh, the, these proto-conscious, these would be proto-conscious, kind of like whitehead, simple occasions of experience. And metaphorically, I look at them as like the notes, tones, and sounds of an orchestra warming up. If you go to a, a symphony before they start playing, every musician is tuning his or her an instrument. You hear these sounds and notes. It's kind of a cacophony of, of noise, at least to me. Some people tell me that there's actually some, some common tonality or something, but I personally don't get that, not being very musical myself. But the point is, it's kind of like noise. And then you, so then how do you organize it? You want to orchestrate it. And so that was the, the question uh, Roger himself posed at the end of the Emperor's New Mind. He needed something in the brain which could biologically orchestrate quantum information processing, um, in, uh, halt or terminate by his Penrose objective reduction at time t equals h over e sub g, 
connecting the space-time geometry, uh, which is non-computable and uh, non-algorithmic, which allows creativity, consciousness, uh, novelty, and so forth to come in. Otherwise, we'd all be uh, auto on autopilot and, and consciousness and free will would be impossible. Platonic values and qualia, awareness and feelings, which must be uh, fundamental properties of the universe. It must be somehow connected to space-time geometry. And whatever, whatever these things were, whatever the mechanism was, uh, they needed to regulate functional neuronal and synaptic activities. So I read this book. I read this. I was blown away by it. I was confused by it. I was in awe of it. And, uh, but I realized one thing, he needed microtubules because he, he didn't have a mechanism for something that could regulate neurons that was small enough uh, to, be, uh, to be in the quantum realm. And I had, at that point, the late eighties, I've been uh, studying uh, microtubules classically for almost 20 years. So I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, I think you need to look at microtubules. And uh, by the way, I'm gonna be in the UK and I'd be happy to come visit you. Visit you. And he said, great. So I did, we met. I talked about microtubules and uh, we began to collaborate back in the uh, early mid nineties. So basically we came up uh, with a model called orchestrated objective reduction, which is a type of quantum computation. So uh, therefore we need a qubit. And uh, on the left, you see the two possible states. So we have a, a, a dipole oscillations in, in tubulin and I'm skipping over a lot of stuff in, in the interest of time, but the, this leads to uh, basically what are Froelich coherent uh, giant dipoles. Herbert Froelich in the late 60s and 70s had a model of biological quantum coherence based on oscillating dipoles that can happen among the aromatic rings uh, inside tubulin. Each tubulin has 86 aromatic amino acids. So 86 of these rings, which is a huge amount for that size of a protein. So they can couple and form a, a uh, and they're, they're shielded from the environment. So you don't have to worry about decoherence and they can form these mesoscopic and macroscopic uh, giant dipoles, which wrap uh, in a helical pathway or a, a longitudinal pathway through the microtubule reaching mesoscopic or, or macroscopic uh, states. And you would need a bunch of these um, to reach threshold a, 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 in a timely fashion. So this, uh, this was the, uh, the, the basic uh, orcoar qubit. And when you had enough of these superposition tubulins, uh, you'd reach threshold and have a bing moment. You need, uh, depending on the time, of course, you'd need, uh, you'd need a lot of them. So uh, uh, if you had a few of them, it would take a long, long time. Uh, if you have a lot of them, it happens fast enough to be useful in the brain. And, uh, and as far as solving the hard problem, the idea is that the redness of the rows is not a pattern, an fMRI pattern or an EEG pattern. It's actually that the space-time geometry configuration that correlates with the redness of the rows, that's qualia, it's, a, its essence, is reproduced in the brain or maybe is entangled with the brain. And that may be the same thing. So that the being occurs in her brain, uh, so that because the space-time geometry corresponds with the space-time geometry of the redness of the rose. So this brings us to Honorbond's uh, 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 study. Actually, this is uh, three or four studies over about ten years, and I think that this slide that he showed is kind of the Rosetta Stone uh, for the brain. And I think uh, in, in years to come, we'll look back on this and in, in awe and you know, marvel at it. I, I still do. It's, it's just amazing. And uh, it, it shows at three different scales. So if you look at A, he's looking at neurons with uh, four, four, five, six uh, nanoprobes. And uh, if you just apply a DC current, uh, the, micro, the neuron, the microtubule is an insulator. Uh, and then, uh, and then in B, you look at a single micro, so you're going smaller and you look at a single microtubule with, with 10 nanoprobes. And at the bottom, you're looking at two rows of tubulin with four nanoprobes. And on all three scales, you're applying, uh, so it, it, if you apply a DC, it's an insulator, but if you apply AC, alternating current and sweep the alternating current, you find certain frequencies where all of a sudden the microtubule Oh, becomes uh, highly conductive, almost, uh, uh, he called it ballistic conductance because there's some classical interface between the probe and, and, the, and, the, and the biology. And uh, you see a pattern uh, which repeats, the same pattern 
repeats every three orders of magnitude. And that pattern is three peaks, and then each peak has three peaks. And you can see that in, in, the, in the insets to the right. So these are the triplets of triplets that he's been talking about. And, uh, and now we can see that at least the triplets directly from, from the brain in the scalp in the DDG. So um, um, th this is, uh, th this shows, th this takes it, uh, and, and this same pattern, if you start lower right from the very fast terahertz, gigahertz and megahertz seen in the tubulin, and then in the microtubule that you see gig gigahertz, megahertz and kilohertz, and they overlap uh, with, with one below. And then at the neuron level, you see the megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz getting up to EEG. So the implication uh, is that EEG is actually kind of the, the slow end. Uh, I hate to mix too many metaphors, the tip of the iceberg of a hierarchy, and it's the slow end. And the other way to look at it is if you're only looking at EEG, uh, it's like going to the symphony and only hearing the low, low frequency bass. You don't hear the high frequency. You don't hear the piccolos, the violins. You don't hear anything except the boom, the, the drum. And, uh, and I think this is what uh, most theories of consciousness do. They, you know, they're just looking at, or just, they're just looking at the slow, the slow end and, uh, and missing, missing uh, the boat entirely, almost entirely. So I, this is, this is the, uh, this is a, this is revolutionary. And, and I, I give Audubon all the credit for it. It's, a, it's just amazing. So this, uh, this led us uh, to come up with this idea of the scale invariant hierarchy extending uh, inward in microtubules into quantum non-locality. So if you get above a certain frequency, and uh, 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 for example, if, if you get uh, uh, below or faster below in size, above in terms of frequency, um, atomic nuclei, you're, you've run out of biology, you're out in space time. And uh, that's where Roger's work comes in and you go all the way somehow to space-time geometry. But in that realm, you're in, uh, you're in, quant you're in the quantum realm and non-locality. So uh, everything or whatever you're dealing with can be non-local. And that can include consciousness, which opens the door for non-locality, for things like uh, afterlife, uh, out-of-body experiences, near-death experience. I saw Jeffrey Mishlov there. He should appreciate this, and uh, as should others. And uh, and so I think that's that's uh, that's a, that's a great uh, possibility to account for those sorts of phenomena. It's also very consistent uh, with uh, Eastern uh, uh, approaches, and and I thank uh, Thomas for helping me uh, come up with with this one, um, where the hierarchy that that we've been working with is shown on the right. Uh, starting uh, at the top, going uh, inward and, and faster. And on the left are the, the five koshas in, uh, in Hindu philosophy, where you go inward, you get more, uh, more highly conscious. And it's pictured as smaller, going deeper inward, and eventually into Brahman, the ground of being. Whereas on the right, uh, we're, we're saying space-time geometry, 10 to the 43 hertz, and maybe they're equivalent. Maybe Brahman and the ground of being are, are, are the same as uh, space-time geometry, or maybe something, uh, something emerging from space-time or something like that. Um, so uh, it, it, accounts, it can account for a lot of things like that. You can also note that the, that the, the scale of the whole universe uh, is, in, if you look at it at a, at a, in a log scale, on the lower right, you have the very tiny plank Planck scale, and uh, in the on the other side of the arc, you have the, the the size of the universe, and at least on a log scale, the microtubule is right in the middle. Now, I'm not sure what that means, but you can think of the the scale uh, extending, um, you know, uh, around this curve uh, for uh, from the top of the microtubule at least down to the nucleus and an electron, and maybe further. So, uh, and uh, Oracle OR or Oracle OR can occur uh, almost anywhere. Well, we don't know really, but it can occur, uh, it can occur along this arc uh, quite a bit. And this can account for uh, consciousness becoming non-local or being non-local, but remaining entangled as a unitary quantum soul, possibly. You know, I don't claim evidence for this. Other people do. Other people uh, uh, spend a lot of time working in this area. Uh, I just want to say that you can't rule it out. So when uh, I hear neuroscientists just kind of turn up their nose or poo-poo this, 
uh, or make other funny uh, comments, uh, I say, you know, how do you know? Until you explain consciousness in the brain, we can't exclude it out of the brain. And if it's a quantum effect, then something like this is quite is quite possible. And there's certainly a lot of uh, at least circumstantial evidence for it. So let me, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, uh, consciousness, when did consciousness arrive uh, over the course of the universe? Was it fairly recently with uh, tools and language? Was it uh, more recent, uh, further back at the Cambrian explosion, the origin of animal cells, the first life, or even before the universe began, as, as some people, uh, philosopher Colin McGinn and Rogers' work would suggest that OR occurred before the uh, universe began. So we could ask the question, which came first, consciousness or life? Neuroscience, Western philosophy would say life came first and consciousness emerged from life, maybe from information processing in the brain. But it's also possible that uh, consciousness came first. The, uh, in panpsychism, Eastern philosophy, spiritual approaches, Whitehead, and Penrose objective reduction, that consciousness preceded life, and therefore life emerged from consciousness. And I think this may actually makes, makes more sense. Um, if we think about the origin of life, uh, which supposedly started in, in a primordial soup proposed in the 1920s by Oppert and Haldane, a simmering oily mix from which biomolecules emerged three to four billion years ago. And then Miller and Ure in the 50s simulated the primordial soup, uh, put all the known ingredients and added a spark, electrical spark for lightning. And uh, at the end, they looked in the beaker and they found amphipathic biomolecules, which have aromatic rings uh, like benzene or phenyl rings. And these are like, look very much like dopamine and, uh, and other biomolecules. Uh, and the, air, the point is the aromatic rings support quantum effects, um, but they have to be together in, in some kind of array. And they, they, they attract each other and organize. And this is how proteins form, actually. So the interior of proteins have a lot of these aromatic rings, uh, which are quantum friendly. And we call those the quantum underground. And uh, they attract and form, and form a micelle with a quantum friendly interior, much like proteins. And so um, uh, in the primordial soup, it's possible, and I uh, postulated this in, in, a, in a paper called The Quantum Origin of Life, How the Brain Evolved to Feel Good, that eventually uh, these, my, these, uh, the, the quantum processes in the, in the rings inside the micelle would reach a threshold for, uh, for Bing, for, uh, for objective reduction, and have a Bing moment, have some kind of experiential moment um, in, uh, in correlating with space time in this micelle in the primordial soup. And uh, these feelings would be random, but some would be positive and feel good. You can think of the uh, Bing as a smiley face there, that, that some of these would be, would be uh, pleasurable. And uh, you can think actually of these rings being a, a qubit and they actually have two stable and one metastable state. The metal state, metastable state is the sandwich at the top. You can think of that as a superposition collapsing to either the, the T-shape or the offset parallel. And one of, the, one of them uh, might be pleasure and one, one might be pain. I mean, it, this is maybe oversimplifying, but something like this may be possible. I mean, quality you have to come from somewhere. And uh, I haven't heard any better explanation uh, other than, than OR. So I just put this out there. So with pleasure as a feedback function, orienting the pi resonance group, did life then evolve to orchestrate and op optimize OR mediated pleasure? And I call this the quantum pleasure principle. So, okay, primordial soups on earth, anywhere else. Well, it turns out that these aromatic rings that are the essence of life and consciousness are everywhere in the universe. They're floating around in space. They're in interstellar dust. They're called polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and they include fullerenes, buckyballs, nanotubes, things like that. And uh, they're and they're formed by stars, and they're in huge huge amounts. Twenty percent of all the carbon in the universe are in aromatic rings. And uh, uh, in this picture um, of uh, interstellar dust, the, the green is fluorescence triggered by starlight uh, uh, illuminating polyaromatic hydrocarbons that are in, in the dust, maybe encased in ice. So you can see the prevalence of them and they're radiating terahertz. And are they, are they communicating? Are they entangled? We don't know. Could they be in some sense conscious if they're entangled having OR moments? 
uh, possibly, I don't know. But um, it, it's something interesting to think about. And I've been, uh, and these polyaromatic uh, rings, uh, uh, structures, floating space has some interesting structures. And uh, uh, I've been learning about this with my friend uh, Dante Loretta, who headed uh, NASA's OSIRIS-REx project, which brought these uh, back from the asteroid Bennu. In fact, it came back about a month ago. And uh, he and I, and I and I'll be helping him, uh, will be analyzing these for quantum optical and neuropharmacological effects. Because structurally, they're not that different from uh, psychoactive neurotransmitters and, and psychedelics, actually. So do they entangle? Uh, do they have uh, a quantum optical effects? Are they inhibited by anesthesia? Do they themselves have psychopharmacological effects if you give them to some poor animal? Or may maybe the animal would enjoy them, I don't know. But could these be the origin of life and consciousness? I think it's possible. Both life and consciousness had to come from somewhere. I don't think, uh, I don't think they just emerged from complexity starting from uh, chaos. That, that doesn't really make any sense to me. Here's a molecule that was found from an asteroid. Uh, uh, sorry, a meteorite that crashed on Earth. Another minute or so, Stu. Pardon me? Another minute or so. OK, almost done. In fact, here's the last uh, slide. This is Dante about a month ago uh, uh, with the, uh, the capsule that came down from Bennu. And uh, he spent the last uh, month or so, they've been uh, analyzing it. And, uh, he, and uh, we'll be announcing results very soon. And we will be working on these for the next number of years, hopefully. So let me conclude with a uh, uh, conclusion saying that theories of consciousness viewing the brain as a complex computer of simple neurons have failed or don't really make any test testable predictions or solve any problems that I can see. Uh, there exists a scale invariant hierarchy, 12 orders of magnitude and frequency in microtubules uh, discovered by Honorbon. Uh, conscious events orchestrated by microtubules governed by OR can occur at various scales, resonate and interfere like musical notes, chords and beats. Therefore the idea of the brain of a quantum orchestra and higher quantum frequencies may enable non-local phenomena, out-of-body experiences, near-death, afterlife, and reincarnation. And uh, as, as I'm sure you know, here in India, reincarnation is very popular. And at the meeting we've been at, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, stuff about reincarnation, interviewing kids about their remembrances. And of course, Jim Tucker at Virginia has been doing this, and Ian Stevenson before that. And consciousness may exist or have originated from entangled polyaromatic hydrocarbons throughout the universe. And I'll just close with a notice for the, uh, the, the Science of Consciousness Conference to be held in Tucson in April. Everybody's invited. Thank you very much.